Okay gang, let's take a look at what I refer to as the backwards problems. Um, that's not a technical term, I just think of it as um, I'm not actually finding the confidence interval, I'm finding a sample size. So to me it's kind of backwards, where usually I'm given a sample size and I find a confidence interval. But what we're going to do here is we're going to figure out what is the sample size for a desired margin of error. And if you remember that phrase from chapter 7, as sample size increases, variability decreases, it's the same deal here. As sample size increases, your margin of error decreases. Or if you want to be more accurate, you're going to need to survey more people or, or have more animals in your experiment or widgets, whatever, whatever you're trying to deal with. So you'll hear this term in statistics called margin of error. When you hear this term, think of the end piece of your confidence interval, the part that you plus or minus. So this formula right here is everything we add to our statistic, right? In a confidence interval, you have P prime plus or minus this thing, and this thing is called a margin of error. And your book uses the abbreviation ME, which is fine. I tend to use MOE, that was the one I learned on, but you can see they mean the same thing. Some folks will use the term error bound. So you've got three ways of referencing the same piece of your confidence interval, and that piece is everything after the plus or minus. So margins of error are always comprised of a critical value times a standard error. And we remember this standard error from chapter seven, that was when you were in proportion land. So what we're gonna do with these problems is we're gonna solve for sample size. You'll be given a margin of error, and then you'll try and figure out how many folks do you need to include in your survey or in your experiment to get that margin of error. So as we read through example seven, I want us to be on the listen for what land we're in. And you might know even just getting started, we're, we're gonna be in proportion land because I haven't even talked about mean land yet. But I want us to kind of look forward and think, well, when we get to the end of this chapter, we need ways of identifying which land we're in. So we will always want to be on the listen for key terms that give that away, or we need to decide what's the variable in this problem. If it's categorical, we're in proportion land. If it's numerical, we're in mean land. So here we go. A company has received complaints about its customer service. The managers intend to hire a consultant to carry out a survey of customers. Before contacting the consultant, the company president wants some idea of the sample size she will be required to pay for. One critical question is the degree of satisfaction with the company's customer service measured on a five point scale. The president wants to estimate the proportion P of customers who are satisfied, all right, that is who choose either satisfied or very satisfied, um, which are the two highest levels on that five point scale. She decides she wants the estimate to be within 3%, i.e. 0.03 at a 95% confidence level, how large of a sample size is needed. Whew. All right, lots of information to unpack here. The first thing I, I would note is that we're dealing with proportions. And there's a couple reasons I see that. The, the word proportion is your biggest giveaway. That symbol P is another giveaway. I also want you to see there was a percent thrown out here. Right? Those are the units of proportions. And I get that 95% confidence level has a percent in it, but that is uh, extra, all right? That, that will show up whether you're in mean or proportion land. They're saying right here they want the estimate within 3%, so we are in proportion land. Now, I want us to start to connect these ideas. When you hear estimate, all right, that's another vocab term for a confidence interval. All right, so estimate and confidence interval, they go, they go hand in hand, right? Because an interval estimate you know, range of numbers is a confidence interval. A point estimate, which is just one number, is a statistic. All right, so all this aside, we know we're in prop land. All right, you know you're gonna be looking at a Z-star critical value. All right, we're only gonna do this experiment once, so we're gonna have one sample. And we need to figure out what that sample size is, right? This, this president, she doesn't wanna to pay to have 10,000 people in this survey if she only needs 5,000. And, and the variable here is categorical, right? You, I'm sure you've been involved in one of these types of surveys where you have to kind of rank how satisfied you are with um, some kind of experience. Maybe it's Amazon or, I don't know, yeah, Macy's, wherever you might shop, that kind of thing, where you have to say like satisfied, very satisfied, not at all satisfied, extremely not satisfied, things like that. 
So they're gonna lump them, these two, into just categories of success. So anyone who says satisfied or very satisfied, that's who they're going to keep track of. All right, so she wants this estimate to be within 3%. So she wants her margin of error to be 3%, which means I'm gonna put 0.03 here on this formula, okay? And then I'm gonna fill in all of this stuff. So let's figure out what all of this stuff will be. All right, the Z star critical value, we know we're going at 95% confidence. Okay. So when I go at 95% confidence, I'm gonna use 1.960. So I'm gonna put that number in, in a moment, okay? So I'll put 1.96 here, I'm gonna put 0.03 here, and I wanna solve for n. Now the, the problem that we run into is we don't know what, a, what the sample proportion is yet, right? Because we haven't done the experiment or the survey. So what we do as stats folks is we put in 50%. So your default sample proportion is 50%. And what this will do is this will give us a, what we call a conservative value for N. Meaning it might pop back a sample size that's a little bit too large, like we might pay for a few extra people more than we needed, but it's gonna keep us safe. So it, we're gonna find an N slightly larger than we needed, but it guarantees our margin of error restriction. So we're just gonna, we're gonna play it safe. So when you hear me talk about a conservative value, I just mean, I don't mean politically conservative, I just mean it's probably a little bit larger than we need. We're just playing it safe, all right? We're not being fast and loose. So here we go. This is gonna be a margin of error problem. I'm gonna write this margin of error formula directly down as written up here, and then I'm gonna fill in my numbers for this problem, and a bunch of algebra is gonna happen. Okay, so let me scooch this up. Now that I've got the formula. All right, so here we go. I want the margin of error to be within 3%. So I can interpret within as less than or equal to. All right, so I want it to be less than or equal to 3%. So let's start filling this in. I know at 95% confidence, I have 1.96 for my critical value. For my standard error, we're gonna use 50%. I'm gonna leave the sample size blank, or not blank, but as a variable, because that's what I'm solving for. And I would like this to be less than or equal to 0.03, okay? So at this point, you've left stats behind, and it's an algebra problem. How do we solve for n? So here we go. The first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna start inside my grouping symbol. So I'm gonna start with one minus 0.5, which is also 0.5. And hopefully you'll give me that 0.5 times 0.5 is 0.25. And if you won't give that to me, let me just show you. Okay, we'll do 0.5 times one minus 0.5, and you're gonna see I get 0.25. Okay, so here we go. I have 1.96 times the square root of 0.25 over n needs to be less than or equal to 0.03, okay? The next thing I wanna do is I'd like to get this radical all by itself. So I'm gonna divide both sides by 1.96. And as we start to do this, you wanna keep your answers as exact as possible or keep as many decimals as possible. These problems are really susceptible to de decimal round off. It can it change, your error, uh, change your answer by a lot if you round your decimals. So I'm gonna leave this as 0.03 over 1.96, okay? So this will cancel on this side and I'm gonna get the square root of 0.25 over n is less than or equal to whatever 0.03 over 1.96 is equal to, okay? All right, so now that we're looking with, or working with that, okay, and, and just so we're clear, you, you could have done this a little bit differently. If you wanted to square both sides first and then divide, it's fine. I just decided to divide first. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna square both sides. If you remember from your math days, if you wanna undo a square root, square both sides. I'm gonna move this up here. So when you take the square of a square root, things cancel, so we have 0.25 over n is gonna be less than or equal to whatever this number is. And I know it's starting to look really ugly, but it's just a number. If I was gonna crunch it in my calculator, just to give you a reference, we have 0.03 divided by 1.96, and then I square that number, right? So right now we're looking at 0.000234 with all of these decimals, I just, I don't wanna write it out. That's why I'm leaving it like this, okay? All right, 
So the next problem we run into is that my n is on the denominator. So if I want to get this denominator, uh, if I want to get n out of the denominator, I'm going to multiply both sides by n. When you multiply both sides by n, this is going to cancel. Okay? And I tend to like my variables on the left side of the inequality. So you see it right here on the right side. I'm going to just write it in the opposite order. So I'm going to put this term on this side and this term on this side. And the thing with inequalities is when you switch how you're writing them, right? Instead of this being on the left, now it's moving to the right. Instead of this being on the right, it's moving to the left. When you switch the sides like that, you also need to switch the direction of the inequality. So this is going to be n times this number 0.03 over 1.96 squared is greater than or equal to 0.25, okay? So again, I'm gonna just reiterate what I said. I, I took the right side of this inequality and moved it to the left side. I took the left side of this inequality and moved it to the right side. And when you switch the direction of that inequality or when you have them switch sides, you need to change the direction of this symbol. Okay. So the last thing I need to do to get n all by itself is divide by this thing. I know it's ugly, but it's still just a number. So now I'm going to divide both sides by 0.03 over 1.96 squared. All right, now this will cancel. And whatever this is equal to, n has to be greater than or equal to 0.02, or excuse me, 0.25 divided by 0.03 over 1.96 squared. Okay, and yes, it's ugly. I'm not denying it's ugly, but it's just a number. So let's see what we're getting here. n will have to be greater than or equal, and let's let's try this, okay? So I'm going to rework what I did. I also think I'm going to sneeze in a moment. Yeah, I think it's coming. Here we go. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, let's clear all this out, and we'll go a step at a time. So I'm, I'm going to start with this denominator. Let me move this over so we can see it. So I'm going to do 0 0.03 divided by 1.96. Yeah, then I want to square it. And then I would like to do 0.25 divided by that number. So I'm going to do 0.25 and I'm going to divide by my answer. When I divide by my answer, I'm looking at 1067.111. Now keep in mind, n has to be a whole number, right? You can't survey 1067.111 folks, but you can survey 1068. So we need about 1,068, right? And these are customers. In her, or I should say the president of this company needs about 5,000, or not 5,000, excuse me, 1,068 customers to guarantee a 3% margin of error. All right, so she's gonna have to pay for at least this many. All right, with 1,068 customers, she's guaranteed a 3% margin of error. With 1,067, she gets dangerously close, right? She's going to have a margin of error like 0 0.03001, but she's got to get pay for that extra customer um, to guarantee that 3% margin of error. So you see all of that algebra is involved in going backwards, and, and it can be a little bit cumbersome, but, but that's what we're working with here. So, so let's retry this. Okay, except now let's say this manager or this president want to do this for a 2% margin of error, right? So we want to be even more accurate. Now you can imagine if we want to reduce our margin of error down to 2%, this number is going to have to increase because to decrease variability, right? If you want to be more and more accurate, sample size has got to increase. Increase sample size, decrease variability, or decrease margin of error. So we're going to run through this all again, but this time I just want to give you a more direct formula in terms of how to solve it. And here's what I mean. If we were going to redo this, right, we're going to do z star p prime, 1 minus p prime over n. This time has to be less than or equal to 0.02. Okay, so the only thing I'm changing from example 7 to example 8 is I reduced my margin of error from 3% to 2%. Since I'm still going at 95% confidence, this is still going to be 1.96, and I'm going to put in my conservative estimate for my sample proportion. I put that conservative estimate of 50% in, halfway between 0 and 1. Now I would need to go through all of this algebra shenanigans 
to get this to, to, uh, to solve for n. But let me show you the more direct formula that you can use. And you're more than welcome to use this. So if you come across these margin of error problems and you're in proportion land, here's the more direct formula. n would have to be greater than or equal to p prime times 1 minus p prime z squared in ratio to your MOE. Okay. Oops, excuse me, your MOE squared, my bad. So if you just want to get a direct number for n, plug these in to this formula, all right? Or plug, plug your numbers into this formula. So here's what I mean. Before we do it here, let's review it with the one that we just did, okay? So if I was gonna do that here, let me put another bubble, all right? If I was gonna do that here, if I was gonna go n is greater than or equal to p prime, one minus p prime times z squared over our margin of error squared, let's see what would have happened. This would have been equal to 0.5 times 1 minus 0.5 times 1.96 squared over 0.03 squared. And let's see what we, we ugh, let's see what we would get if we plug that into our calculator. So if I did 0.5 times 1 minus 0.5 times 1.96 squared, oops, let me move that down, and I divided that by our margin of error squared. What number do I get? 1067.111. And I would argue that's probably easier for us to handle than going through all of this algebra. I like the algebra, but I can understand why some folks are like, that's cool. I, I, I'm gonna do a hard pass on the algebra and I'm gonna go ahead and just use the formula. So in this case, now we're going 2%. This would be 0.5 times one minus 0.5. Our Z is still 1.96, but our margin of error has been reduced to 0.02. So let's plug in and see what number we get from there. All right, so I'm just gonna redo this. If I plug in 0.02 this time, I am looking at n has to be greater than or equal to 2401. And hey, if it's gotta be a whole number, I can actually use 2,401 customers. So you can see, just to go from 3% margin of error down to 2% margin of error, you have to more than double your sample size. Hey, it's a lot to get that margin of error to reduce. All right, so with that, that's our look into proportion land. Um, we're gonna switch over to mean land. We, we had dealt with mean land in chapter seven, um, and we're gonna extend upon the stuff that we did in chapter seven uh, once we get to the next page. All right, I'll see you in a bit, bye.